Race and place and bridging spatial divides. This week on the Laura Flanders Show, if we don't plan fast, global warming will drive us ever more apart. Veteran author and organizer Carl Anthony shares how some towns are planning for justice now. In conversation with Ashley Dawson, author of the new book, Extreme Cities. All that and Avery Bang puts a new spin on the Incan tradition of building footbridges for freedom. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done Take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Five years ago, Hurricane Sandy destroyed thousands of homes in New York City and around the tri-state area. Some bounced back, many not. Houston took a major hit, and San Juan is still struggling to get the lights on after successive hurricanes hit those cities this season. Cities, in fact, have been revealing their vulnerabilities in the face of climate catastrophe and the deep inequalities we've allowed to develop and what they cost us. What is to be learned from these crises and their aftermath? Today's guests have given this a lot of thought. Carl Anthony is an architect and regional planner. Among other things, he's co-founder and co-director of Breakthrough Communities, an Earth House Center project dedicated to building multiracial leadership for sustainable communities in California. He's also the author of The Earth, The City, and the hidden narrative of race. Ashley Dawson teaches at the City University of New York Graduate Center and at the College of Staten Island, and he's the author of Extreme Cities, The Peril and Promise of Urban Life in the Age of Climate Change. Well, welcome to you both, glad to have you. Thank you, it's really wonderful to be here. Ashley, let me start with you. You say cities are ground zero for climate catastrophe. How so? Um, well, uh the majority of humanity now lives in cities, right? We have planetary urbanization happening over the last 50 years. Um, so masses of people are concentrated, masses of economic assets, and very vulnerable infrastructures are there. Um, the UN is projecting over three degrees of climate change if we continue on present trajectory, and that means that over 275 million people are living in highly vulnerable coastal cities. But so. don't we also hear that cities are the grand place for environmental conservation? We don't drive, we take public transport, we live in groups, etc. Yeah, well, there's something to be said for that. Um, but not all cities are like New York City, concentrated, right? We know you mentioned uh, Houston, that many cities are exactly the opposite, that they have huge sprawling footprints and their development often makes people highly vulnerable. Which people in particular, Carl, what's your research shown as to who's vulnerable in a climate crisis well, in a city? Well, uh, one thing that we've noticed a great deal is that uh, the vulnerable populations are also they're economically uh, at risk because they, they don't necessarily have uh, the financial means to deal with alternatives. They also have uh, some transportation issues to address. And then uh, when extreme weather events hit, uh, many of those people are displaced to hundreds or even a thousand miles away from where they used to live and so they uh, move to places where they're not necessarily easily uh, received as uh, uh, full members of the community so they're in in a new context where uh, there are not the services that are necessary and uh, facing new issues. Is that what you mean by extreme cities Ashley? Yeah, exactly. I'm looking at the confluence of economic inequality, which often has a very strong racial component, and uh, new forms of extreme weather that cities are really important in driving, right? Cities are responsible for about 70% of carbon emissions. So um, we have this phenomenon of unequal cities and extreme weather bearing down on them, and the inequality of cities makes them less resilient. You know, it's cities that are relatively um, socially tightly knit together, they're able to weather climate disasters the best. So the personal knitting together as well as the structural and infrastructural. Oh yes, I, I certainly agree with that. I, uh, I think that um, uh, many of the cities that we work in have uh, 
extreme polarities in terms of wealth and income, uh, and uh, they have different impacts on populations depending on uh, their, their resources. So we find that when we have extreme weather, we also have an exacerbation of patterns of inequality that have gone deep in the city's history. So, but you've been working on this sort of research for your entire lifetime, as far as I can see, Carl, both as an architect and an urban planner and an advocate and a writer. Um, was there anything new revealed in what's happened this year? I wouldn't necessarily say it was new, but it was kind of a wake-up call. I mean, we just recently in Northern California experienced uh, uh, an explosion of fires that resulted from uh, a malfunction of the PG&E, but it was basically the dry uh, grasses and uh, forests uh, that led to widespread fires that we were not uh, necessarily prepared for. Did you think, Ashley, finally some penny has dropped? We're going to see a new generation of policymakers make different decisions? Well, with the Trump administration in control of the federal level, that's obviously not happening. But as many people have talked about, um, the urban scale is an important uh, site for transformation. And I think there have been lots of important initiatives which New York City has engaged in since Hurricane Sandy, but there's a long way that we still need to go. I mean, our, our pension funds here in the city, for instance, are still invested in fossil fuels. So on the really kind of big scale, there are big changes that still need to happen. And that whole coastal um, sort of seaboard, I want to say, but it's really the coast of the river, um, the trendy Williamsburg area, as far as I can see, there's no stopping the development there. Yeah, we really need a moratorium on coastal development. As you say, that's not happening. In fact, uh, the so-called far west, you know, the west side of Midtown, which has been the dream of urban elites to develop for the last 30 years, is going up you know, pell-mell right now. We invest our capital in this real estate development, but it's also capital that's sinking, quite literally. So what are some of the solutions in terms of the responses that you think make sense your work urges us actually to start very much with the personal, really. We have to realize that the migration of populations to the city often has different impacts on the cultural and racial groups. I know that when the uh, heat island effect in Chicago in the 1990s, um, populations that uh, did not have kind of social cohesion had dramatically uh, worse outcomes in terms of exposure and vulnerability. Older people, for example, who were isolated from the surrounding communities uh, had much greater percentage of uh, fatalities and various other incidents than those populations that were more cohesive in their daily life. So can you mandate co city cohesion, population cohesion? Well, I'm not sure that you can mandate it, but I do think that there are forces that uh, ha have helped to exacerbate the problems uh, of communities that are not as cohesive. And as it turned out, the recent immigrants of uh, largely Latino populations had much more cohesion than the African-American community that had been uh, located in Chicago and was probably coming apart uh, for the from the dynamics that had been going on there for uh, several generations. So uh, each community is different, and there are uh, challenges that we have to face with each community. So what do you recommend legislators do? I think we don't really realize how important community organizing is. We don't realize how much, how important it is to uh, uh, really begin to address the, the root causes of urban disinvestment and, uh, and the social and economic responses to that. So a really important element in any solution is the ability of communities to respond to crises. And that means, uh, we're better community organizing, the better off we are. I think there needs to be a state-led, really radical and rapid transition to renewable energy. And, uh, you know, in New York State, that's something that is being pushed for, but we still haven't got there. Um, so there has to be a lot of mobilization around that as a goal. But in the meantime, I think environmental organizations can do a lot to push and to begin to transform everyday life in communities in the city. For instance, we act, uh, this environmental justice organization based in Harlem has a wonderful climate adaptation plan where they call for social hubs 
to get people together and educate them about climate change, but then also for microgrids based on renewable energy that is controlled by the community. So the community gets the economic benefits of putting power back in the grid, and the community gets the jobs that come with construction of renewable energy infrastructures. So you know they're not waiting for the legislators on the state or federal level. They're starting to plan for this on, on the ground now. Carl, you've got actual projects on the ground that you've been part of in the past. Well, we, we have some examples uh, that point the way toward uh, more effective solutions. Uh, one example that we're uh, very proud of is that uh, when the state of California enacted uh, legislation called SB 375 that called for uh, an enactment of uh, reducing the CO2 emissions from our transit uh, patterns uh, mm -hmm. where 40 percent of the uh, CO2 emissions were coming from uh, from the transportation sector, uh, they the state realized that that would mean uh, really changing our uh, our cities from over reliance on automobiles, especially single passenger automobiles, uh, to one that uh, was building upon uh, access to public transit. What it really meant was. Uh, the, the cities who, that were developed in the suburbs that were automobile dependent became in an instant not nearly as attractive. And the, the, the great fear that, came out, that grew out of that is that the populations, the poor populations that were living in, uh, in uh, transit dependent communities uh, were suddenly threatened to be uh, displaced by new populations that were moving into those cities whereas the, the poor people who lived in the cities before were being pushed out to the suburb. So here I am thinking this new commitment to public transport is going to create greater cohesion and more people working together. Actually the opposite. Well, it, I mean, I think it's, it's really true for different parts of the population. There's many, in many ways more cohesion for the uh, uh, middle and upper income families that have, are needing to learn how to live together and depend on each other and the poor people who actually had to learn that in the past are going to be displaced mm. by, by new patterns that are sort of making uh, life more difficult for them. To what extent do the dynamics that Carl is talking about, particularly the racial dynamics he's describing, really an unexamined piece of our inability to make progress on, on this bigger spectrum, especially for as long as people think, well, that real disaster is only going to hit those people, those people different from me. Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely true, right? I mean, cities are extreme because of 30 years of inequality and basically the co-optation of governance by elites who... Redlining. Exactly, who are interested in making money hand over fist through gentrification. And I think there's an increasing concern about adaptation, which we all are in favor of in some level, leading to climate gentrification. So we're, we're faced with kind of climate apartheid and dispossession of people and forced migration as well as you know, forms of gentrification on local levels. So yeah, the, the kinds of um, inequalities that both of Carl and I are talking about, I think really need to be dealt with and confronted directly. All right, so give me some examples that would cheer me up now. <laughs> um, well, I mentioned before We Act's plan, right? Um, an important part of what they're doing is proposing community land trusts to take land out of capitalist real estate markets and allow communities to have control over what happens on that land, whether it's you know, forms of sort of living with water through construction of bioswales and other um, f forms of protection from extreme weather to uh, green energy and microgrids. So you know, there's planning for this, pushes for it, and um, I'm gonna be testifying later this month at the city council calling for divestment of pension funds. So you know, um, the, the idea of switching to 100% renewable is something that there's a very strong political push behind. We just need to get um, rather Machiavellian leaders like Cuomo on board through really strong political pressure. We often talk on this program, I, I often talk about new economies and new models, and I'm increasingly being reminded that a lot of what we talk about as new is actually not new. It's reinventing things that people used to know. Mm. Um, you've written a lot, Carl, about the contributions, really the invisible contributions of African Americans to architecture and planning. We discovered that people who had been uh, struggling for 30 years to implement uh, solutions that would build greater cohesion and accountability to communities suddenly became really 
much better position to respond to uh, the challenges that uh, came up around climate change and around uh, public policies that were implemented uh, in these communities. So we found that, for example, that we could actually build and mobilize uh, communities really rather quickly without having to go through an education process because people had been already fighting uh, against gentrification and displacement, had been mm. fighting for transportation justice, had been fighting for health equity, had been fighting for uh, uh, job opportunities for people who live in the cities. And so when the state imposed this idea of SB 375, these communities were actually in very good position to be able to move forward uh, in response to those challenges if they could be organized together. And we were able to make significant inroads because we built on that yeah. 50, uh, 20 or 30 year heritage of those communities. And on the other side, you have populations who um, had come up with all sorts of innovative ways to, to keep their living quarters cool and, and ventilated. But then, of course, rushing to get air conditioners was a great sign of modern accomplishment. Um, how do you balance all of this, uh, Ashley? The, the sort of the new, the old, the innovation, looking back? Well, I, I'm looking recently at a um, million climate jobs proposal in South Africa. Um, and I think that's a really positive solution, the idea that we could have a more equitable future coming out of this crisis in some ways um, for cities creating employment, right? One of the big disillusions of post-apartheid South Africa is that the ANC didn't come up with the kinds of jobs with the real transformation and uh, the kind of promise that was in the Freedom Charter, which you know people struggled for for so many years. But part of that proposal is also to keep people on the land, you know, and to ensure that they can maintain traditional forms of agriculture, which, as Carl was pointing out, were based on what we in the United States tend to call kind of organic agriculture, you know, not industrial agriculture, not using fossil fuels and pesticides and large inputs. So yeah, there's an element for many people of holding on to time-worn traditions which actually do function and which are far better suited for the world that's coming than the world of fossil fuels and pesticides that we've been living in in the developed world for the last 40 years. Perfect. Thank you both. Ashley, Carl, really a pleasure to talk with you. The books are available at our website. You can find out more there. LauraFlanders.com. Thanks. Bridges to prosperity. Sometimes when we use that phrase, we're talking metaphorically, but sometimes we're absolutely not. Avery Bang builds actual bridges, mostly footbridges, that can be the difference between rural isolation and access to health care, education, and markets. Her organization, called Bridges to Prosperity, imagines a world where poverty caused by rural remoteness no longer exists. And she actually teaches communities how to build their own footbridges over wild rivers and gorges in partnership with local organizations and professionals. I had a chance to ask Bang about her bridges this November in New Orleans at TED Women, at an extraordinary annual gathering of women visionaries, and not just visionaries, but bridge builders of the very real rope and lumber sort. Here's Avery Bang. There are over one billion people in the world that lack safe access. And so if you kind of break that down, that's one in seven people that literally live in a walking existence and cannot get to where they need to go. The people that actually live in the areas where we all rely on our food supply and or just the majority of the population in the world, they're living at the ends of the tips of the leaves on the trees in the forest. And I think as opposed to looking at transportation networks only from the trunk out, it's incumbent upon us to think about how do you get sustenance from the outside in. I think a lot of planners forget what's happening in the rural last mile. So really what's at the very ends of where everything is sourced and coming from or needing to get to also could be called the first mile, depending on where you think of your source of origin. And I think that that's actually the most interesting. It's the coffee you drink in the morning. Where does that actually come from? It's not actually coming from the regional center on the coffee bag. Um, and when you're a community health worker, whether you're in a rural place in Montana or rural Uganda, you're actually responsible for reaching that rural last mile. And I think that if we could start to think in planning terms of how to connect 
all of the people, uh, we'd be, all be better off. We believe that that infrastructure in the pedestrian world, where people live with literally the very least, is the highest rate of return. So whereas we would absolutely build anything in a transportation infrastructure suite, pedestrian infra infrastructure has the highest rate of return. A bridge is an equalizer. Everyone can equally use that public service um, to access the, thing, the goods and services that already are there. Peru, I think, like many developing countries, is um, such a huge percentage of the population walk to school, they walk to whatever farm or work jobs, um, they're walking to a medical clinic. And so in that space of walking, there's a tremendous inequality between people who live close to the services that exist and those who live on even the, the fairly near outreaches of that urban center. Um, so when I arrived in Yavina, Peru, it's a community of maybe 600 people, but 300 of whom live on the other side of some type of river. Just experiencing firsthand how different the lives of people were who happened to live on this side of the river versus that side. And it has this quality to it where it's like, you can see it, but you can't have it. That seemed just so unjust at some level. What really struck me was um, I wasn't going in and trying to change anything culturally or even in some level trying to change a system that I didn't yet understand, but putting in built environment infrastructure helped to at least make sure everyone in a tertiary area had access to the goods and services that did already exist, get their goods to market, to send their children to school, to get their mothers to have attended births. Um, we have some really interesting data coming in uh, about how bridges affect education. We found in a three and a half year longitudinal study that in communities that received a bridge, there was a 30% higher um, increase in household level income. And so that's at the household level attributable to one bridge. Um, in, in Nicaragua, that translated to these bridges roughly paying for themselves over five times over in the first year alone. And what's interesting is that's not all taxable income, but just in terms of the new economic activity in a community, five times over whatever it would have cost. But bridges last for 30 years. And so we believe that even though a pedestrian bridge might not solve all of the world's problems, it will be one of the ways that you can start to create more economic prosperity in rural areas. We really believe strongly in the principle that this should be a community-driven entity and project. Um, so working through and with whatever hierarchical structure or governing structure is really important. Understanding really what are your challenges? Really why would you want to have access? What would that give you? What percentage of your population would care about that? And, and really trying to dig into the why. And once we understood concretely this was a major game changer for this community, then we move forward into the, and then how can you help? The nearest place that you could drop materials was over a three hour hike. So for those materials that were brought in, you had to be imagining walking down a mountain and through a valley, 80 pound bags of cement, that's two meter long pieces of timber, that's a steel rebar, digging anchor pit holes big enough to replant big trees, but you're doing it by hand. and um, getting cables across rivers using just really simple, like how do you get someone to swim across the river? And how do you get them to have a rope tethered to their stomach so you can get the first rope across? So you have to use a lot of ingenuity and creativity uh, as well as engineering. To date, we've built 270 bridges um, serving nearly one million people. So it's, uh, it's an evolution. I think my first bridge in Peru I looked at very differently than now I look at how do we build many, many more bridges um, and how do we make an impact that's far greater than just saying what's done and it's there, but really what's the systems change that we're creating while we build these projects. So we believe there are about 100,000 locations where a bridge is a high need priority uh, investment. I live in the River North Arts District in Denver and there's a river that cuts through just to the south of the intersection of the two most prominent interstates. So when Interstate 70 going from the airport to the mountains came, cut through uh, originally, it isolated this community called Globeville. Globeville is predominantly a Latino population. Um, the history of Denver is fairly industrial and 
uh, families that have been there for generations helping really grow the economy but that have largely been left behind and they're not even able to access the new um, transportation development that is happening. For example, a light rail to go out to the airport or go down to good jobs. And there they are, of course, forgotten again. And that community continues to be the lowest um, levels of income and education in the entire urban uh, city. But it's within sight distance from the highest growth in urban development. So we've been working on a bridge project, and it will be completed for just under half of what the, the city originally budgeted because we have a more lean infrastructure approach. Um, so we believe that this bridge will be an equalizer for them. If you enjoyed that conversation and want to hear my thoughts about the week, sign up to become a monthly member at our website and receive exclusive access to all our extra content. Don't forget, follow us on social media and you can write to me to tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. Until next week, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura.